In this presentation, we're going to look at how to calculate the flexural strength of pre-stressed concrete members. By the end of this module, I want you to be able to calculate the ultimate flexural strength using the rectangular stress block approximation. Use ACI 318 expressions to estimate strand stress at ultimate strength. Check whether the section is tension controlled according to ACI 318. Determine if a section meets the minimum flexural reinforcement requirements. Calculate the ultimate flexural strength using the strain compatibility approach. Briefly describe CFRP, carbon fiber, and high strength stainless steel strands, and explain the benefits of using them in your design. And calculate the ultimate flexural strength for pre-stressed members with these different types of strands. We can calculate the flexural strength of pre-stressed concrete members using the same assumptions that we do for non-pre-stressed members. We're going to assume that we have a rectangular stress block, which approximates the actual stress distribution in our concrete. And this rectangular stress block will have a beta one factor, which helps us to determine the depth and an alpha one factor of 0.85, which helps us to determine the uh, magnitude of stress here in our stress block. These factors help us or ensure that we have the same centroid and the same area for our stress block that we do with our actual stress distribution. And we can calculate our beta one factor based on F prime C. And uh, other ACI assumptions will assume that the strain at the ultimate compression fiber is equal to 0 0.003 at failure. One difference between pre-stressed and non-pre-stressed members when looking at the flexural strength is the stress in the reinforcement at time of failure. With non-pre-stressed members, we'll assume that we have the yield strength at failure. So we assume that we have an elastic plastic material. And with pre-stressing, pre we need to calculate the stress in the strand at the time of failure, at the nominal flexural capacity. So this F sub PS. And this F sub PS is going to be somewhere in the range between our, or, or it'll typically be in the range between our yield stress and the ultimate, stre uh, ultimate stress in the uh, strand. So typically between 243 and 270 KSI. The maximum stress that we can have in our pre-stressing strands is limited based on the type of pre-stressing that we have. Uh, if we have Typical strands, um, typically we'll have grade 270 KSI strands, so with an ultimate strength of 270, but older strands can have a lower strength 250, or we can have a high strength, a high strength pre-stressing bars, like Dewey DAG bars, and they'll have a, an ultimate strength of around 150 KSI. We can determine the stress in our strands at the, uh, all, at the nominal moment capacity a few different ways. Uh, the one that we'll talk about a little later is the strain compatibility approach, uh, where we can solve for the, the stress in the strands using actual stress strain curves for our strands. We can also use given equations in ACI 318 or, or AASHTO LRFD. So the equation shown here is from ACI 318 and we can calculate the stress in the strand um, at, at ultimate failure based on uh, this equation here with a number of different variables. Uh, the first variable here is this gamma sub p factor, which accounts for the, the shape of the stress strain relationship of our pre-stressing steel. The gamma sub p factor is, uh, varies based on the ratio of our yield strength in our steel to the ultimate strength. Typically, we're going to assume that we have a yield strength of 243 or 0.9 F sub PU. So our gamma sub P factor is going to be 0.28. Some of the additional variables required for this equation are, are shown on this slide, where rho sub P is the ratio of our pre-stress reinforcement. D sub P is the distance between the extreme compression fiber and the centroid of our pre-stressing reinforcement and B is the width of the compression face of the member. So I'll highlight it on the next slide, but if we have a, a member with flanges, 
we need to uh, use the width of the compression face when uh, in here for B. Our row and row prime are reinforcement ratios for our non-pre-stress reinforcement. And our row is our tension steel, our, our uh, tension reinforcement, non-pre-stress reinforcement, and row prime is the compression steel in the top here. Our, our B, again, is the width of our compression face. So if we have a, a T-shaped section where, we're bending, where bending is going to cause tension in the bottom and compression in the top, then, then our B is going to be this distance here on the compression face. Uh, note that if we have compression reinforcement, there are two additional uh, requirements provided by ACI. So uh, we just need to make sure that um, we, we meet these limits. If we have a fully pre-stressed member where we don't have any non-pre-stressed tension or compression reinforcement, then those row and row prime um, components of the previous equation go away and our equation will simplify down to this one. So in this class, we'll mainly look at fully pre-stressed members. So we can, we'll skip straight ahead to uh, this equation here. Note that in design, sometimes it's, it's easier if we have non-dimensional forms of these equations. So here are some uh, non-dimensional forms for uh, these equations shown above. The equations that we looked at on the last couple slides were all for bonded reinforcement, where we have a, a bond between the strand and the surrounding concrete or strand and surrounding grout. If we have unbonded tendons, then we need to determine the stress at ultimate failure using the uh, equations provided in this table. Uh, and note that the F sub S E here is the effective stress in the pre-stressing after all pre-stress losses. So uh, if we have a, a post-tension structure with unbonded tendons, then we would need to calculate our F sub P S from this table. If we go back to our, our section with our strain and our stress and force diagrams, we can calculate our A, our compression block depth through our equilibrium, just by setting our compression forces equal to our tension forces. So our compression, we only have the concrete uh, stress block and our tension, we only have the pre-stressing tendons. So we set our co concrete compression component equal to our pre-stressing component and solve for A, which is our only unknown. So here our compression block depth A uh, is equal to this equation shown here, where B is the width of the compression zone. So this top width here. So th that might be different if we have a, an I section or a T section or, or some section with a, a wider top flange. We just need to make sure we use the, the top width here. Our nominal moment we can find by just summing our moments about the centroid of our compression block. So here, summing moments about the centroid, we have one force component, this AP times FPS, and then our distance component is D minus A over two. So that's where we get that distance component. At this point, you can pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example problem one. Next, we have our example problem two, which is calculating the nominal moment capacity for a T-shaped section. So this section here. So you can pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example problem two. On the next few slides, we're going to talk briefly about strength reduction factors. Strength reduction factors are applied to the resistance side of the equation to account for variability in material strength, bar and strand size, member dimensions, bar strand placement, and also an analytical variability. The uh, load and resistance factors are calibrated to achieve a desired reliability or safety index. So essentially we wanna, uh, they're, they're calibrated for a certain beta here, a beta uh, greater than three or three and a half, just to make sure that we limit the probability of failure of a structure. Our strength reduction factors depend on the type of failure that happens. So if we have a, a flexural failure, depending on if we're tension controlled or compression controlled, 
will have different fee factors, our, our strength reduction factors. Tension controlled is a, a ductile fail, failure. It's more predictable. So we, we have a higher uh, fee factor here um, with 0.9. Our compression controlled failures, there's more variability and uh, we have lower, and it's a more brittle failure. So we have lower fee factors here. So typically we'll have uh, other sections, sections without spiral reinforcement. So our fee factor will vary between 0.65 and 0.9, depending on the strain that we have in our, our pre-stressing strands. The strength reduction factors are dependent on the yield strain in the material. So for deformed reinforcement or non-pre-stressed reinforcement, we're going to use the actual yield strain for the material that we're using. Uh, other than grade 60, where we can assume a yield strain of 0 0.002. For all of our pre-stress reinforcement, we're going to assume that we have a yield strain of 0 0.002. So this yield strain will give us the uh, previously used tension controlled limit of 0 0.005. Note that our strength reduction factors are also going to vary for pretensioned flexural members where all the strands are not fully developed. There's a certain required length, uh, transfer length and development length that uh, are required to transfer our, our stress from our pre-stressing strand into the surrounding concrete. If we're within this transfer distance or the development distance, then we need to further reduce our fee factor. So you can see we, we can use this table here uh, to calculate our reduced fee factor based on uh, where we are within the transfer length. Um, note the distinction here between all strands being bonded versus one or more strands being debonded. If we're using debonding, to help control our end region stresses, then we just need to make sure that we check where we're checking our flexural, flexural strength and if we're able to develop those strands um, at that point. And if, if not, then we need to reduce our fee factor. The information provided on the previous slide and the table is also provided graphically in ACI 318 as shown on this slide. We have additional strength reduction factors based on other types of failures. So here you can see uh, our fee factor for shear and torsion, bearing on concrete, and the shred and tie method. Our next code check related to the flexural strength of our pre-stress members is a minimum flexural reinforcement requirement. This requirement says that we need to provide enough reinforcement so that our factored nominal moment is greater than or equal to 1.2 times the cracking moment strength. With pre-stress concrete members, we're going to have a higher cracking moment because of the pre-stressing. And we wanna make sure that we have enough strength so our member doesn't crack and immediately fail. If we have a nominal strength less than our, our cracking moment, then this would be the case. So that's what this check is doing. For, for this check, we need to check our, or calculate our, our, look at our equation for our bottom fiber stress, including our pre-stressing and uh, the pre-stressing time eccentricity, and set our bottom fiber stress equal to the tensile strength of our concrete. We can solve for M cracking, and this M cracking is going to be the value that we use in this equation here. You can now pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example three, where we're going to determine if the section shown below, which is the same from example one, meets the minimum flexural reinforcement requirements from ACI 318. Next, we're going to talk about the strain compatibility approach. And the strain compatibility approach is a more general way to solve for the stress in the pre-stressing strands uh, at, at the flexural strength. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the actual strain diagram. We're gonna look at the strain in the pre-stressing at time of failure. And we're going to use an actual stress strain relationship to relate this strain to the stress in the pre-stressing. 
The total strain in our pre-stressing is going to be made up of three different parts. We have the strain from our stress here, we have the effective pre-stressing strain, and then we have our decompression strain. The epsilon p sub f we can figure out from our strain profile, assuming that we have a, a linear strain profile, so we can calculate it using this equation here. The effective pre-stressing is dependent on the effective stress in the pre-stressing divided by our, our the modulus of our pre-stressing, where the effective stress is our jacking stress minus the total pre-stress losses. And then finally, our decompression strain, the strain required to get us back to zero strain in the pre-stressing, we can find using this equation here, where P sub E is the effective pre-stress force. Typically, this decompression strain is going to be minor. Um, I, it's, it's recommended by Dolan and Hamilton, so I, I include it here just to be uh, complete. We can then use the strain that we found on the previous slide with whatever stress-strain relationship that we want for our pre-stressing to calculate the stress in the pre-stressing. So here are just two common ones. The first is the modified Ramberg-Osgood equation with some coefficients for low relaxation strands. And the second is the, the PCI handbook method also uh, described in Dolan and Hamilton's textbook. On the next few slides, I'm going to go through the general procedure for using the strain compatibility approach. Our first step is to calculate the locked in strain at the time of ultimate loading. For this, we need to find our effective pre-stressing strain and our decompression strain. We'll need to determine our pre-stress losses using any procedure and then take our jacking stress minus our total losses to get the effective stress in the pre-stressing. We take this divided by the modulus for our pre-stressing to get the effective pre-stressing strain. The decompression strain we can find based on the effective pre-stressing force and some of our gross section properties. So this is just our effective pre-stressing stress times the total area of our strands to get the force and, the, and then we plug it in here with our different gross section properties to get the decompression strain. And as I mentioned before, this epsilon D is, is a minor component and it's often neglected. Step two of the strain compatibility procedure is an iterative process. We need to start by assuming an initial value for F sub PS. Typically, if we, if we start at around 260 KSI, it's a, it's a reasonable first guess. Uh, if we set it up in Excel, we can use a, a solver to, or goal seek to come up with the exact stress that, that's in the strand. But anyway, we can start with an initial guess for F, F sub PS and 260 KSI is a good starting point. Next, we calculate the depth of the equivalent rectangular stress block with that assumed F sub PS. So from equilibrium, we can calculate our A. From our A, our stress block depth, we can calculate C. So we know uh, the neutral axis depth and the stress block depth based on our assumed uh, F sub PS. Since we know the neutral axis depth, we know C, and we know our top fiber strain, uh, since we're assuming it to be 0 0.003, we can calculate the flexural strain using our strain diagram and this equation here. We can add this flexural strain to our uh, epsilon sub PE and epsilon D decompression strain and our effective pre-stressing strain to get the total strain in our pre-stressing strands. Our next step is to determine the stress in the pre-stressing based on the total strain that we found on the previous slide. And we can use whatever procedure we want here or whatever stress-strain relationship we want here. I'm showing you again the PCI design handbook approach since it's, uh, the, it's a simple equation. So we would calculate our, our stress here using this equation. And our last uh, kind of sub step to step two is to compare the stress that we find using this equation to the stress that we assumed back in um, you know, the first step of, or the, yeah, the first sub step of step two. And if our assumed stress is equal to our calculated stress, 
then then we're done. We can move on to a uh, bigger step three. Our last step, or last larger step, step three here, is to calculate the nominal moment capacity based on the flexural stress that we determined from step two. So we have our, our F sub PS now. We can sum our moment about the centroid of our compression block. So we have our, our tension force from our pre-stressing times the lever arm, dp minus a over two, and uh, we can find our, our nominal moment. And we can check our phi factor or determine our phi factor based on the flexural strain uh, epsilon p sub f, or epsilon sub pf. Now you can pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example problem four where we'll calculate the nominal moment capacity for the same section that we had in example two, except this time we'll use the strain compatibility approach. Pre-stressing strands can be more susceptible to corrosion than conventional reinforcement, which is one of the reasons that we wanna make sure that we keep our pre-stressed beams crack free. Uh, this is one example of a bridge collapse that was caused by corrosion, the Lowe's Motor Speedway. This was a four-span, simply supported, pre-tensioned concrete uh, structure that collapsed just five years after construction and injured about 107 people. Corrosion, was, or corrosion damage was found at, at the um, harp points, so the points where we had the harp devices. They had grout used to plug uh, these Hold down, or the points where they took out the, the hold down devices, but um, the grout was found to have high chloride content, which actually accelerated the corrosion of these strands. So you can see we had conventional steel strands, accelerated corrosion at the hold down points, which are the point where, where they needed the, the, mo or the highest flexural strength and uh, failure of the pretension beams. Because conventional pre-stressing reinforcement is susceptible to corrosion, there's a, a, a recent push for using corrosion resistant materials in place of conventional steel for the reinforcing bars and also for the pre-stressing strands. A couple different types of corrosion resistant material are shown here. The first is carbon fiber reinforced polymers, so CFRP. And you can see here, you, uh, there are CFRP strands and also CFRP uh, non-pre-stress reinforcement. Uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer can be used, but uh, only for conventional reinforcement. And it can't be field bent. So um, also note CFRP can, cannot be field bent. High strength stainless steel, or HSS -S, <laughs> is, can be used for either conventional reinforcement or for pre-stressing strands. And you can see some, some pictures here. Some of the benefits for using corro corrosion resistant materials are, are shown here. Uh, their use can extend the service life of a structure. It can decrease the life cycle costs, i.e. reduce the maintenance costs. And it can also reduce the required cover so you can have um, more efficient use of your reinforcement. The main disadvantage is the higher initial cost. The actual cost of the CFRP and, and uh, stainless steel, steel materials can be up to 10 times that of conventional steel. But because the cost of reinforcement only makes up a small portion of the overall project cost, um, you can see it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take your total costs times 10. Um, here you can see uh, they're, they're used in, in an FDOT uh, pre-stress piles, it only increases the cost by about one and a half times. And depending on the project, this can be even, even less or even lower. We're going to go through uh, a few slides on each different material, and we'll start here on the carbon fiber reinforced polymer. So you can see uh, the comparison between the stress strain curve for our CFRP compared to conventional pre-stressing strands. You can see that with CFRP, we have a lower stiffness. So we go from 28,500 for uh, KSI for conventional pre-stressing steel uh, down to 22,500 KSI for our, our CFRP strands. 
And you can also see that we have a decreased ductility. So with our CFRP, we're linear elastic up until the point of failure. So the ultimate strength is a little higher at 350 KSI compared to 270 for conventional pre-stressed steel, but we don't have this, this uh, um, plastic range. So we don't uh, have any type, type of yield plateau like we do with the pre-stressing strands. You can see here some pictures from some example projects that were completed by Tokyo Rope. So uh, they've done uh, pre-stressed box beams, pre-stressed concrete piles, and, and different slabs with all with uh, CFRP reinforcement and uh, CFR pre CFRP pre-stressing. With respect to the design of structures with CFRP strands, uh, much of our design knowledge comes from an NCHRP project that was recently completed, uh, as shown here, the NCHRP project 1297. Uh, these researchers over five years performed a literature review and, and uh, experimental numerical research with full-scale beam testing, looking at re relaxation losses, um, creep shrinkage and thermal losses, and then also some uh, details and any issues that were uh, surrounding strand harping and harping of the strands. And they made some recommendations on, on several different items related to design with CFRP strands. The first item that I wanted to, to highlight was the design recommendations related to strain reserved for flexure and maximum strand stress. CFRP strands, because they're so brittle, we need to kind of change our design methodology a little bit. Um, so most of the failures are controlled by the rupture of our CFRP strands. So essentially what, what uh, the researchers recommended was to make sure that you have a certain amount of strain that's reserved for the ultimate strength of a member. You can see here in this uh, figure they recommended that a reserve strain uh, needs to be greater than 0 0.004 um, so that you have sufficient ductility uh, in your flexural failure. This proposed reserve strain works itself out in the recommendation for the maximum jacking stress. So you can find your maximum jacking stress based on 70% um, of the ultimate strength and uh, a reserve strain here of 0 0.004. So we can calculate that. And then also have we have other stress limits here uh, based on if we're looking at immediately prior to transfer or after all of our losses. These are our upper stress limits. In terms of our pre-stress losses, the researchers found that elastic shortening, creep, and shrinkage pre-stress losses can be found the same way that you do with steel strands. Um, they recommend using ASHTO LRFD, but you know, a similar thought process would go and, and you could use the PCI design handbook approach as well. And in terms of relaxation loss, they propose these two equations for post-tensioned and pre-tensioned strands. When looking at flexural strength, the failure of these pre-stressed concrete beams with CFRP pre-stressing can either be controlled by rupture of the CFRP strands or crushing of the concrete. So if we have rupture, then we're going to have the ultimate strength or we're going to reach the ultimate strength of the strand before we crush the concrete in the top. And if we have crushing of the concrete, um, we're going to have a strand stress less than the ultimate strength at the time when we uh, crush the concrete in the top. When we have crushing of the concrete controlling our failure, we can use the same strain compatibility approach that we did uh, before. We can assume that our, our top fiber strain is 0 0.003 and uh, go through with um, you know, the, the, the same approach that we talked about earlier in class. When the rupture of our CFRP strands controls failure, the concrete may not reach the ultimate strain of 0 0.003. Because of this, we need to use the beta 1 alpha and alpha 1 equation shown here um, to calculate our, our stress block details. Our beta 1 and alpha 1 were calibrated for concrete strengths between 5 and 15 KSI. 
and we'll see how to use these in uh, the accompanying example problems. Finally, a reliability study was conducted as part of this NCHRP project. And from this study, they recommend a resistance factor of 0.75 for both compression controlled and tension controlled failures. At this point, you can pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example problem five, where we calculate the flexural strength of the section shown here, which has CFRP strands. Next, you can go to the example problem six, uh, where again, we're looking at the flexural strength of this rectangular section with CFRP strands. On the next few slides, we're going to look at high strength stainless steel strands. So stainless steel gets, it is a corrosion resistant material and it, it gets its corrosion resistance uh, because of this thin passive surface film on the outside of uh, the, the stainless steel. Um, you can see here some of the, the material composition of, of our different types of stainless steels. Um, this grade 2205 uh, duplex stainless steel is the most common stainless steel used for uh, pre-stressing strands right now. High strength stainless steel is going to have a lower ultimate strength compared to traditional pre-stressing steel. It's going to have a lower stiffness. So sorry, the, the, uh, the strength is going to be around 250 KSI compared to current um, conventional pre-stressing steel of 270 KSI. The stiffness is going to be lower. So we're at 24,500 KSI compared to 28,500 KSI for conventional pre-stressing steel. And we're going to have uh, less ductility. So a smaller ultimate strain. So we're, we'll, be, we'll have an ultimate strain in the range of 0 0.014 to 0 0.02. And that's compared to uh, an ultimate strain of 0 0.04 to 0 0.05 for, for conventional pre-stressing steel. And you can see some examples here uh, of pre-stressed pile from uh, Sumadin wire. On this slide, I give you two reasonable stress strain curves that you can use for uh, high strength stainless steel. One is based on the modified PCI or based on the PCI handbook equations with some modified factors. And the other one is based on the modified Ramberg Osgood relationship with a proposed uh, coefficients here, uh, proposed A, B, and C coefficients. The two equations shown on the previous slide are plotted here. So you can see the linear elastic range, and then we start to go nonlinear, and then um, we can fail the material at a strain of around 0 0.014. Similar to CFRP strands, the flexural failure of a member with bonded high strength stainless steel can either be caused by rupture of the high strength stainless steel strands or crushing of the concrete. And uh, we can use a similar procedure as what we looked at for CFRP with our high strength stainless steel strands. And the materials are somewhat similar. So there's still research ongoing about with, for a high strength stainless steel strands, but it's reasonable that a, a similar resistance factors to CFRP uh, can be used. So a fee of 0.75. At this point, you can pause this video and go to the accompanying video for example seven, where we find the flexural strength of a T-beam with high strength stainless steel strands. On the next few slides, we're going to go through a comparison between the behavior of a rectangular section and a standard pile with the three different types of pre-stressing material that we looked at. So conventional pre-stressing steel, CFRP pre-stressing strands, and high strength stainless steel pre-stressing strands. 
Um, I, I, I did all these analyses in response 2000, and I used the uh, stress-strain relationships uh, for the strands based on the, the modified ramberg osgood equations. The ramberg osgood relationship was used for the stress-strain behavior of all three types of pre-stressing. I, um, so the A, B, and C here for steel are known values for low, re low relaxation strands. The values for CFRP and high strength stainless steel I developed just to, uh, I'm proposing here just to have a similar curve to what we had in, um, or, or from material tests. So um, you can see these are the material curves that I used in response 2000. In the comparison, I kept the area pre-stressing and the jacking stress for the pre-stressing the same for all three strand types. Note that different strands have different strand area or different areas and different strand types you may want or you do want to jack the strand to a, a different pre-stressing stress. So this isn't actually true, but I, I just wanted to you know, try to get a side-by-side -side comparison just based on the difference in material curves. So that's why I kept those the same. So you can see the area and the jacking stress that I used for the, rectang the rectangular beam the, from example one, and then the area and the jacking stress for the standard 18 inch pile. You can see the stiffness uh, affects the initial locked in pre-stressing. So um, I calculated e each one of those um, based on the, the material stiffness and the jacking stress. Here you can see a comparison with the example one section, so the rectangular beam between, and this is with no axial force, with steel, CFRP, and high strength stainless steel strands. So as would be expected, we have more ductility in our, our section with conventional steel. We have a higher strength with our section with CFRP strands. They have the higher, um, higher ultimate strength and the High strength stainless steel beam had similar behavior, but it, uh, to the conventional steel strand uh, or the beam with conventional steel strands, but you can see it failed at, at a, a smaller curvature. Here you can see a comparison between the performance of our standard 18 inch pile with our different strand types with no applied axial load. And you can see that the type of strand doesn't really have um, much effect on the, the ultimate capacity here. And this has to do with the um, strands being distributed over the, the height of the section and the failure being controlled by crushing of the concrete. You can see here the moment axial load interaction diagram for our standard 18 inch pile with conventional steel, CFRP, and high strength stainless steel strands. I'm highlighting here the, the point where we're going between concrete crushing controlling failure and strand rupture controlling failure. And uh, you can see that in, in compression here where concrete crushing was controlling failure. There's not much difference between the behavior of the three different piles. When tension starts to control the failure, you can see the, and as we would expect, the properties of the steel are having more effect. So our higher strength CFRP is going to have a higher capacity. If we start adding tension and looking at our moment curvature behavior, we'll see that uh, will have much less ductility in sections with CFRP and high strength stainless steel strands. Uh, so you can see here the blue, the conventional pre-stressing steel, the orange, the CFRP strands, they have, again, the higher um, ultimate strength of the material gives a higher ultimate strength for the pile. And then the high strength stainless steel is, has a, a similar behavior to conventional steel, but it just fails at a much lower load. That concludes this presentation on the flexural strength of pre-stressed concrete members.